Now we're going to read in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 5, the, the Sermon on the Mount of Christ. We're going to read in Matthew 5 and we're going to read in verse number 21. Matthew 5 and verse 21 and we'll read down to verse 32. Matthew 5, 21. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Araka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, Leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, Thou shalt by no means come out thence, till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. You have heard it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, That whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, Hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if thy right eye offend thee, Pluck it out, and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, And not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, Cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell or Gehenna. It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you, that Whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, commits adultery. And that will do with, with God's blessing. Now, if you were here last night, you'll know that we're dealing with um, a subject matter about following Christ in an age of confusion. And uh, we're trying to make sense of the world around us just now by looking at the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. As he brought this great sermon, the Sermon on the Mound in a chaotic day. And we looked last night at a great subject, the subject of purpose and identity. Why are we here? Where are we going? What are we all here for? And the Lord gives very clear answers in verses 11 down to verse number 20 on that subject. A massive subject. There's a lot of emptiness around. There's a lot of purposelessness, uh, even amongst believers. And the Lord deals with that subject. We're now going to move to uh, a, another great subject, the subject of relationships. And uh, the reading forms into two parts from verses 21 down to verse number 26. We'll be dealing with relationships, horizontal relationships between ourselves and how we get on with one another. And, uh, and then we'll deal with the moral relationships and the marital relationships and the romantic relationships that are formed too in verses 27 down to verse number 32. So big subjects, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ didn't miss the big subjects the big tough ones, and uh, there's some really tough stuff in this section here, and I would need grace, and I would ask for your prayers as we seek to handle these sections tonight. Now, <clears throat> just remember, chapter 5 deals with the requests of the king. He's making requests of us, and we're subjects of the kingdom, and we're sons in the kingdom, and when we come into chapter 6, we'll see some of the rewards he'll give us for living this way, and they will review our lives in chapter 7. But here it's the great requests of the great king himself, the Lord Jesus. In this very chapter, he speaks about that Jerusalem is the city of the great king, and he's referring to himself. And we're going to see something of his authority in a minute. Now, I suppose there's a clear link between the Ten Commandments and the Beatitudes that are found here in this great sermon in the first few verses. As he gives his moral principles for his kingdom, there's a clear link between the Ten Commandments 
and these sayings and teachings that he gives here. And last night we really dealt with the first commandment. You'll have no other gods before me. And we're doing things for his sake, for my name's sake, we'll suffer. And we're the salt of the earth and we're the light of the world and we're standing bearers for his scriptures. And he is the great exponent of the word of God. And really what motivates us is God. But we're now going to look at commandment number six and commandment number seven. You'll not kill and you'll not commit adultery. You'll not kill as verse 21 down to verse 26 and you'll not commit adultery as verse 27 to 32. And we're going to see that the Lord Jesus Christ is the perfect interpreter of the law. He just said in verses 17 to 20 that heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall never pass away. And he's, he's really showing to us that the scriptures are eternal, down to the last jot and tittle, and that he is the fulfiller of them all. That's what he says in verse 17. He says, I've not come to destroy the law and the prophets, but to fulfill. He's the one who embodied the scriptures, and he's the one who fulfilled the prophetic utterances concerning the Messiah. But we're going to see that he's not only the originator of scripture, and he's not only the one who's the fulfiller of scripture, he's the true interpreter. And so there's a phrase that's going to appear again and again now. I say unto you. You have heard it's been said of old time, but I say unto you. And the authority of Christ to interpret the word of God is going to be seen before us. Now, there's real conflicts. The real temptations here, the real trials. Why? Because in life there are real conflicts, real temptations and real trials. If there's someone on the phone here and, and your home's perfect and the assembly that you form a part from is perfect, you're not going to learn anything tonight. But if we're all here and we realise that there's an imperfect world around us and there is so much that is that we're ashamed of and so much that we've got to learn, then we'll maybe learn something from the teachings of Christ here in these sections. So dealing first of all then with the, I suppose, the commandment number six, thou shalt not kill, as he gives the interpretation here in verses 21 to 26, just a little breakdown. There's a little formula that you'll see. First of all, in verse 21, he'll remind them of what they already knew. You've heard that has been said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill. So there's a bit of a reminder of, the, of Exodus 20 and of things that they would have known about. And then there's a response from the Lord about it in verse number 22. But I say unto you. And he's going to expand the issue of murder to include being angry with one another. We'll see that in a second. So we've got the, first of all, the reminder, then the response. And then you've got the resolution in verse number 23. The man there is to be reconciled to his brother. He's to leave his gift at the altar and in verse 24, you have the reconciliation taking place. In the last two verses, 25 to 26, you've got a recap of the main points and a request from the Lord how to resolve issues when they arise amongst us. So it's all about conflict resolution. It's all about how to stay friendly with one another. It's all about what to do when issues arise that can create tension in a relationship. And I think it's very pertinent. So let's start dealing with the verses and deal with this great subject of relationships. <clears throat> so verse 21 to start off with then. Ye have heard that hath been said by them of old time. Some folks say it should say to them, and our translation says by them. I don't think there's a huge amount of difference in it all, to be honest with you. But the point is this, who's the them? Who is the them? Now clearly there was a rabbinical tradition that made all sorts of rules on top of the scriptures. I mentioned it last night that, that they had various rules um, that they would add to the word of God. Maybe the clearest example of that in the chapter is found in verse 43. I've just asked you to cast your eye to it so that you can see what I'm saying. In verse number 43, it says these words that we should love. It says in verse 43, you've heard that it's been said by them. So there's the formula. You've heard that it's been said that we should love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, well, nowhere in the Bible does it tell us to hate our enemies. It does tell us to love our neighbours. So what had happened is these rabbinical, in the rabbinical traditions, these men over the years added to the word of God. And they said, well, we have to love our neighbours, but the neighbours, that would be the Jews and maybe other folk. They could be our enemies. And they began to add to the scriptures 
and in doing so, said things that were never found in the Bible at all. So what the Lord Jesus is doing is correcting the misunderstandings from the oral traditions of people who'd added to the word of God. That's one of the reasons why we must be very careful not to add to scripture. And it's very important to ensure that the translation you have is not something that's adding to the word of God. That's an accurate translation of scripture because down to the last jot and tittle, the scriptures are the word of God. Now, with that in mind then, with that kind of formula in mind, <clears throat> Let's have a look at what it says here in verse 21. Ye have heard it been said, thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. So what these in the oral tradition had said was that if you murdered someone, you would be in danger of the judgment. And the judgment was the village court of elders. It's referred to in Deuteronomy 16 that each area, each village would have a, a range of elders who would make decisions and pronounce judgment. And they said that the sin of murder could be dealt with by that court. Now, there's nowhere in Scripture that teaches that, but that's what they said. And uh, they said that that matter could be sanctioned by them, and of course, the death penalty could be enacted at a village court level. So that was what was being referred to by the Lord Jesus here in verse 21. Now, it would be easy for me to go from this and begin to speak about things like euthanasia and abortion and so on, and murder and violence, which is in our society, and the violence and all around us and in games and in, and in all the video material that we see. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to deal with what the Lord Jesus said to us, which is far more searching, even more searching than these big subjects I've just alluded to. Notice what he says in verse 22. But I say unto you. And before I say anything else, that's an incredible statement. I, what authority. You know, these scribes would quote the rabbis to substantiate their teaching. But here in contrast, the authority of Christ, I say unto you, the one who is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets, the one who is the origin of the word, the author of the word, the personification of the word is the true interpreter of the word. Here comes with all authority. And as he begins to unfold that murder is, goes beyond the act of killing someone, it starts in the heart. As he begins to unfold, it involves anger. He mentions three tiers of authority. He speaks about the, the judgment. Then he speaks uh, uh, about the, uh, the council, which is really the Sanhedrin. And then he mentions hellfire, Gehenna. And you'll see three escalating layers of authority. Uh, we would say the sheriff court, the high court, and ultimately the Supreme Court. And over all these courts and over all these authorities, the Saviour says, I say unto you. He is the supreme authority. So the true interpreter of the word of God is our blessed Lord Jesus Christ. Is it not wonderful to be saved, brothers and sisters, and know that we have the true and interpreter of scripture teaching us here the word of God. Now, what does he say? Well, he says that this issue of murder, this issue of killing someone, isn't just that violent act of taking a knife or a revolver or a rope to someone, it actually starts in the heart, and it's when you're angry. That's a lot more searching, isn't it? Because then now we all have to hang our heads, because we're all guilty of it, aren't we? There might be some of you here, and you've got a short temper, and you know you're guilty of it, but you know what? Even those of us here, the most mild-mannered mild brother and sister in this call, has at times been guilty of this very sin. And so it's very searching what he says. And he uses words that might not be in vogue today. Um, things like raka and fool and so on. Uh, and, you know, words, words change their meanings and words are, you know, dependent on how they are associated by popular consensus in a particular area have more meaning. And how you use them as well and how you say them matters. And there's words perhaps over here in Fife that, that we use, you wouldn't use, up in Perth or over on the West Coast, you know, words can change. But I don't think any of us are going to miss the meaning of what the Saviour says here. There are things we can say to one another that can deeply damage us. And when we use these words, we know what we're trying to do. And so that danger of a, a, an escalating situation is brought before us by the Lord Jesus. First of all, you're angry with your brother without a cause. Now, he does say, our brother here on a number of occasions. 
And as opposed to the Jew, that would be the brother in their own family and then the brother in the, 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 the congregation at the synagogue. And I suppose it would extend to the wider society and the community and the, and the, and the workplace too. And I think it refers to too, um, my brother uh, in assembly fellowship and my brother in Christ anywhere. And I think by extension, it would apply to wider society as well. So I don't think there's any problem with realizing that this word applies to us. And how can we be angry with our brother without a cause? Well, we're going to come to that, but normally, um, normally when it's without a cause, there's an attack really on their commodities and their accomplishments. That there's things that have got under our skin about what they have or what they've achieved, if it's without a cause. But then raka, that word is the Aramaic term for an empty-headed individual, and you're attacking their capacity to understand anything and their character. Now, we don't use the word raka in Scotland, but I have heard a Scottish man say to another Scottish man, you're just a nobody. I've heard another expression, you didn't count. Now, whilst we can find that quite humorous, in certain contexts, that type of expression can utterly floor people and damage them permanently. And words can be like counters, and the power of them is in the way that they're expressed, the timing that they're expressed, and how they're expressed, and the motivation they're expressed with. And so we have to be aware of the danger of our own words. But then it goes further. And it speaks about a fool here. Now, th that word for us is maybe, it's maybe been slightly watered down a little. It's the word morass. And um, the etymolo etymology of the word means the inability to comprehend. Um, but it becomes equivalent to impious or godlessness when you begin to see it sh as it's found in scripture. It's really not, a, not, a, not in as much attack on the character of the person but an attack on their very Christian faith and their carnal attitude. If I look at this word, uh, fool here, as it is found in the, the Greek words found in the Septuagint version of the Old Testament, I learn in Isaiah 32 and verse 6, it says this, The vile people, the vile person will speak villainy, and the heart will work iniquity to practice hypocrisy and utter error against the Lord. That word vile is the word fool. So it's about their relationship with God. In Deuteronomy 32 verse 6 it says, do you thus requite the Lord, O foolish people? So that I could argue that in all uses of the word there's always the suggestion that the relationship with God is in doubt. So you can see what's happened here. First of all you're angry with someone without a cause, you then attack their character and then you begin to even question whether they're saved at all. Now if you've never seen this escalating thing, I don't know if you've ever lived, because these things happen, and they happen even amongst Christian communities. So the subject matter before us is very, very important, and it could happen to any single one of us. So first of all, we have to begin to take a step back and say, how do we stop this kind of thing happening in the first place? What would the, what would the interpreter of the law, what would the Lord Jesus have to say to us about relationships. Remember, what he's looking for is happy, cordial relationships amongst God's people. When you get into the issue of divorce and remarriage and marital issues in the next session, he's looking for happy marriages and stable homes and loving fellowships. That's what he's looking for. And brothers and sisters, there's many people in this line, I'm sure, and, and be quite honest, you're quite lonely. And friendship is something you long for more of. And every one of us are the same, you know, we, we like to have good friends. And the scripture says that we have to be careful then how we relate to one another. And maybe I could first of all speak to the, the person that was saying the word raka, the person that was saying the word fool, the person that was, was angry without a cause and so on. We have to be aware that our actions can excite attitudes in others. If we begin to brag about our holidays to someone who can't afford a holiday, it does actually create a tension. It does create a problem. If you, before you click that Instagram photo, just began to think, what's that saying about me? What is that going to portray to someone else? 
are they going to be induced to be jealous about what they see in my life? And, you know, we can begin to think about the wise acts that we could begin to do in order to create a more cordial relationship amongst God's people. And think about people who perhaps don't have as many friends as we are, because he that hath friends must first show himself friendly. So we're going out our way to reach them, to contact them, and to make them feel at home. There's certain things that are obvious not to do. Way back in 1 Samuel 18, you know, there were some ladies and they began to sing a little ditty. It went something like this here. Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. I don't know how the tune went. But I'll tell you one thing, it really riled King Saul. It says that from that day and forward that Saul eyed David. That was the start of the envy and the jealousy. King Saul couldn't stand David because the popular consensus was that David had done more in the fighting the enemies of God's people than he had. And I suppose we learn this lesson that we don't compare people in public. We don't put people either on a social media or, in a, or on a public oral platform and say these two people and then compare them. That creates tension. That creates envy. So there's things we can do to try and prevent the type of tensions and the type of problems emerging that we're seeing the Lord Jesus addressing here. Equally, on the other side of the coin, the person that's been on the receiving end of these things, you know, we, we too can be friendly, can't we? We too can pray for godly companions, and maybe there's very few of them we know, but we can pray that God will lead us into contact with godly people, and we can be kind. It says in Ephesians 4, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. And I think that, you know, just remembering how he forgave us helps us just in our relationship with others to go out our way to try and be friendly towards others. And we can try and keep a happy disposition. I don't believe, you know, that the Christian life should be one marked by joy. I don't mean by that a zany grin, but I do believe that there's a disposition that is given to us of joy and a disposition that we can have happiness. It says in the Proverbs, a sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy is the rottenness of the bones. And we have to be aware that envy can rise up in any one of us. When we see someone get something that we think probably was better given to us, or someone achieve something that we think we should have achieved, it's amazing how the old green-eyed monster can well up within us. And keeping a happy disposition, it says in Colossians, forbearing one another, you know, and, uh, and we need to get God's help to do that. But may God give us help to be happy with what God has given us and to be thankful to the Lord um, to the, the blessings that he's given us. It says in Colossians 3, let the peace of God to which you uh, rule in your hearts, to which you're called in one body and be ye thankful. And so a kind of thankful spirit helps in life's tensions and in life's journeys. And of course, we can look at the Lord. Do you remember in Psalm 69, it says that they hated him without a cause. That the perfect man who always did the right thing, who always said the right thing, who always said things with the right motives, who always said things in the right way, they still hated him without a cause. And when something happens to us and there's no reason for it at all, just remember you're treading in the footsteps of the master himself. And so, Getting our eye on Christ really helps. If we study each other too closely, we'll, we'll all get a big disappointment. But when you study Christ, you know, we're always, always finding perfection. I think also giving the, 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 the persons that are beginning to irritate you the benefit of the doubt. I think this is a very important uh, point. Um, rather than taking every detail that you see in their life to reaffirm your belief, Look out for the first stirrings of those feelings. Give people the benefit of the doubt. If you walk out of a shop and they didn't say hello to you, it just might be that they weren't being rude and this might be they didn't notice you. In other words, there might be situations arise and you take it as a reaffirmation that they don't like you. It just might be 
that they didn't see you at all. And so this idea of giving people the benefit, I think that's a healthy thing to do in our relationships with one another. And work hard on behalf of others that you find difficult. Go out of your way to try to do good to others who make you sometimes feel angry. Philippians 2.4 says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And try, as you pray for them, and I hope you pray for them, to find something in their life that you can thank God for. I always think if we can give something, one thing in their life that you can thank God for, it really helps us to be motivated to do something for the glory of Christ in their life. That said, things can escalate and things can build up and people speak about personality clashes and, and you know, you can begin to remember how you felt when maybe your mum died or your father passed away and how they, how they didn't speak to you or they didn't do, show any concern and build up, things can build up in our minds and before we know it, we're in stage number two. We're at the point where we're saying, Raka, we're beginning to question their character. We're beginning to think they're empty headed. We're beginning to question what they've got between their ears. And before you know it, you're saying things that you're deeply regretting or you're thinking things that you're deeply regretting. And remember that forgiveness is an act of the will. It's not something that happens without your say so. It's something that you must choose to do. And so it says in 2 Corinthians in chapter 1, to whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. If I forgive anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sake forgave it I, in the person of Christ, lest Satan should get an advantage of us. And so that the unforgiving spirit is what Satan loves, because he can work on that. And he can get you to speak to a few others. And before you know it, there might be a few of you thinking the same way against someone else. Now, that's how it all starts, brothers and sisters. And that's what the Lord Jesus was referring to here as murder. Isn't that serious? And that's where godly friends can help. When we begin to get the wrong perspective, confess your faults one to another, James 5. Bear one another's burdens, Galatians 6. Comfort yourselves and edify one another, 1 Thessalonians 5. You know, it's important that we can speak about things where we know we're going wrong ourselves. Or oh, they might have wronged you, but you're beginning to go wrong your, yourself, the way that you're thinking about them, and perhaps the way that you're show, expressing your attitude. And just remember, people that have wronged us very often have got many, many issues in their lives. And perhaps they're projecting all the faults on us as a coping strategy. If we can just think about their needs, it does help. But it might be that it reaches stage three. And now you begin to question whether they're saved at all. And you've come to a conclusion that you don't know if they're really one of Christ. And here's a child of God, and they may be even in fellowship with you. And you've now put a question mark over their salvation. Now, notice what the Lord Jesus has to say about this. He says to the person who might feel wronged here, that there's an escalating authority. I, from a village court to a Sanhedrin, which would be equivalent to, I suppose, the, the, the major court in, in, uh, of the priests in Jerusalem, to Gehenna itself, to hell fire, it says here. Says someone, well, I thought all my sins were forgiven me on the basis of the blood of Christ. Thank God they are, brothers and sisters. Do you not thank God that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses us from all sin? I, I love those verses. Your sins and your iniquities I will remember no more. And yes, once in Christ and Christ forever. John 10, 28. I give unto my sheep eternal life and they shall never, never perish. You say, well, why does it mention hell fire here? Well, do you remember in verses 20 and also in, in, in the previous verses, it was suggesting that there was people that the Lord Jesus was speaking to who had an external ritual, like the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, but they had no inner reality. And if they were behaving in this way, they would face eternal judgment. It wasn't a case that everybody the, the Saviour was speaking to was saved. But those of us who are saved, it doesn't blunt in the force of this. It does say that there will be a day of review for us one day as Christians at the judgment seat of Christ. And yes, although my sins are forgiven, my conduct in relation to my brother and my sister will be reviewed and assessed by Christ himself. Now, that is sobering. 
And so I'm learning here that restoration, and I say this with some thought, I trust, is harder than salvation. You might remember the children of Israel when they came out of Israel and were um, baptized in the Red Sea and were saved by the blood of the Lamb at the Passover. A couple of million of them came out. But when they were restored, there was 50,000 that came out with Zerubbabel. Sometimes restoration is even harder than salvation. When you were saved, you admitted, I am a guilty sinner, but Jesus died for me. There was admission of guilt. But restoration demands that you recognize that even that person that's wronged you, that there's been an attitude in your heart and perhaps things that you've said and done are also wrong. And it's recognizing those things in your own life, even if the other person you feel has wronged you. <clears throat> Remember this, when it comes to reconciliation with our brother and our sister, it's not down to us. The things that are impossible with us are possible with God and God gives the enabling strength. So what is the resolution? Well, the resolution is found in verse number 23 now. He says, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember thy brother a thought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. So I learn at least four principles then about how to resolve it. And the first one is nip it in the bud. You know, you're, you're going to the altar and there you remember and you leave and you go. Someone says, you, you know, how could he have forgotten? How could the person have forgotten that there was such a big problem? Well, it's amazing how we can push all the bad stuff to the back of our mind, isn't it? And believe that, you know, um, it'll just stay there. And it's also possible that we could believe that if we can serve God um, without putting matters right. Brothers and sisters, we can't serve God without putting matters right. That's what this verse is telling us. But I also believe that God pricked a man's conscience, that as he goes to worship, then he remembers, I've not put matters right with my brother or my sister. And so he leaves. And I think there's just something about the timing. Nip it in the bud. Don't allow things to fester. Get matters put right between your brother and your sister. You know, you've got to use this word. It's so difficult for us to use. It's called sorry. Just say sorry. It's amazing what can be resolved with that one, one word. But it's amazing how difficult it is for people to say it. But then it says, not only the principle of nip it in the bud, but also get the right priority. You see, forgiveness comes before worship. He wasn't to offer his gift then go and see his brother. He says, there he remembers he was to leave first. One Samuel says, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. The Lord Jesus teaches in Matthew 9 here, go ye and learn what this meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Psalm 26 says, I'll wash my hands in innocency, so will I come past thine altar. In other words, God expects us to put these matters right before we approach him. Now, I tell you, if that principle had been outworked, most of the issues in family life, assembly life, would be resolved very, very quickly. We must put it right before we can approach God. I do believe that's a principle that's found in the scriptures. And then also, make the first move. He says, you go and leave the brother that hath ought against thee. That person that's apparently uh, done the wrong to you. <clears throat> now in Matthew 18, it says in verse number 15, these words, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between him, thee and him alone. So there, the person that's been wronged goes and sees his brother. But here, the person that's wronged the other brother goes to see. And I've often, it's often been said, you know, if you put Matthew 18, verse 15, next to this verse here, verse number 23, both of them will be meeting halfway. The person that's been wronged and the person that's wronged the other are first to put matters right. Brothers and sisters, there's never a reason for saying, I'll just wait for him to come and see me, or I'll just wait for her to come and see me. It's quite clear that we put matters right by you making the first move and reach out to that person, no matter who they are and no matter what they've done. Remember, God reached out to us. We were dark, dark in our sins. Just reach out to them. It's amazing what God can do when you make the first move. And there's a fourth principle. Do it in the spirit of worship and contrition. 
You see, he was going to the altar, perhaps with his offering. People have suggested a trespass offering. Oh, that's not in the text. But, but the idea of going to worship and then leaving, and then in the spirit of worship, going to seek the forgiveness and the reconciliation with your brother. You know, the manner in which you seek reconciliation is very important. People need to believe that you're contrite. They need to believe that when you say sorry, you mean sorry. And if you do it in the spirit of prayer and worship, you know, that will be very, very precious. You need to be able to humble yourself before them. You see, there's something bigger than you here. And there's something bigger than me here. And there's something bigger even than us here, the two of us, or the three of us. There is a relationship with God. And there is the collateral damage of all everybody around us that's affected by this conflict. And so there's just something about the spirit that is done in. It's also found here in this resolution here in verse number 23. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, there's nothing like being reconciled with your brother and your sister. Nothing. When you come into verse 24, first be reconciled to thy brother. That word reconciled is the only word time it's used here in scripture, and it means to change your mind. You see, nothing could change my mind without him or her. Well, you know what? God can change your minds. And God can change your attitudes. And if there's a willingness to be reconciled, reconciliation will take place. But he has to, first of all, go and, and show the intention. And God, by his enabling power of the Holy Spirit, will give the parties help to say sorry. Very commonly, when it gets to this level of conflict, each side thinks there's only one side to the argument. It's everything what so-and-so said. But there's always two sides. And as you begin to reflect on attitude and words, whatever God gives you grace to say sorry for, say sorry for. The will to be reconciled. And no matter how painful it is, remember this, that as you release someone, that's what the word forgiveness means, to release. As you release them by an act of your will of forgiveness, you too are released. There is nothing more releasing than being able to forgive. It's an act of the will. And it's also an act of love. Remember, the person that you're forgiving very often has a whole range of problems and they've projected them all into you because it's the only way they can cope. Just remember that you're doing something that Christ did to you the day you were saved. You're forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you unconditionally, completely, by the help of God's Spirit. Now, brothers and sisters, I believe this is an essential teaching today. As we look and survey our history, there has been many, many conflicts and difficulties and trials that have ripped families apart and assemblies apart. May God give us help to pray that we'll act in this way. And remember, it starts with the little niggles. And this would be a worthwhile online broadcast. If there was issues between brothers and sisters on this line, which were resolved tonight, reconciliation took place. And even divisions amongst God's people in assembly fellowship, if they were resolved today, God would bless. And the blessing would pour out upon us. And perhaps this period of isolation is so that all of the tiffs and the difficulties and the trials and the problems and the relationship issues can be resolved and that the world around us sees us as people of peace. Remember, that's what the Saviour put it all down for. And that's why he has this requirement in verses 25 to 26. It's almost a recap of the issues. He says, agree with thine adversary quickly. Literally, be friendly with your adversary. It's a legal term of one who's opposing you, as it were, in court. While still on the way with them, whilst you have common ground with them. It's the danger of leaving it linger and fester until it moves into stage two and stage three. Timing is crucial here. Make it quick. And what it says is, if you don't, it will involve others. Why? You'll deliver you to, your adversary will deliver you to the judge and the judge to the the, the officer and you'll be cast into prison and so on. And this idea of involving others in your conflict becomes apparent. It could be a literal judge. It could be a conflict, a business transaction between two brothers and one sadly takes the other to court, something they're never asked to do, according to verse 
Corinthians chapter number six. And before you know it, the problem's escalated. And when lawyers' letters appear and letters and elders and other groups of people begin to appear, the problem begins to escalate and involves a loss of control to the individual and a loss of their liberty. And in some cases actually means prison. That's the point of the verse, that as a business problem emerges, it could lead to a legal issue and a civil lawsuit taken out. And before you know it, we're in a very difficult place altogether. And so he says, this will involve others. This will involve loss of control and involve loss of liberty. And this will cost you to every grisly detail is resolved to the very last farthing. Instead of actually solving it and, and getting the relationship resolved, you begin to look over minutes of meetings and letters and you'll look at behaviours all the way through. And in actual fact, the fight will be more important than the original problem. And, you know, very commonly, these things begin to escalate out of control of the people's concern way beyond what they ever thought was possible. And brothers and sisters, those of us who are, who are elders in God's assemblies, we need to be on our knees about these matters, that we nip these things in the bud before they fester and develop and grow. It could happen in your family next. It could happen in my family next. It could happen in the next assembly. These are matters that the Saviour has given to us for a reason. And so relationships matter, brothers and sisters because we want to be a place of harmony and hope and peace and love. You know, just last week, I met a friend who I hadn't seen for 27 years. We're school friends together. And he said to me, you know, I used to be envious of you. He says, he wasn't, he's not saved. He says, I used to sit in your homes. He was referring to the, 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 uh, the, the family altar. As you read your Bibles with your mum and dad. And I could hardly remember it, but he was there. And he says, I remember the harmony, the peace and the love in that home. You know, brothers and sisters, the world outside knows nothing of it. What we as Christians can produce. I had to tell him I was envious of him. He was a better football player than me. He was a better golfer than me. He was better this than me. He was faster runner than me. You know, it's strange how we can think, isn't it? Brothers and sisters, let's remember this. There are certain things that are very important. And let's look out for the first festerings of these things in our hearts and produce lives and homes and assemblies marked by peace. But then, of course, there's this other big subject, the subject of adultery in verses 27 to 32. And it's speaking now about romantic relationships. It's speaking about sexual matters, and it ultimately it's going to speak about marriage and even about divorce. And what are the, the Lord is looking for is homes that are stable, marriages that work. He's looking for relationships that are, that are pure, and all of this is found in this next section here, <clears throat> purity. Again, the formula is there, verse 27, a reminder of what they had heard. You have heard that have been said by them of old time. Again, a response of the Lord, but I say unto you. Again, a resolution in verses 29 to 30. And then finally, the requirement and the recap in the final verse, verse 31. Again, we'll just deal with this subject now. These are huge subjects that the Saviour introduced to us. <clears throat> First of all, he says about here, about this, the, the sin of adultery, he says it's not just the act, it starts in the heart. He says, he that looks on a woman to lust has committed adultery with her already in his heart. And that word look is not a passing glance, it's the deliberate engaging. And there's an external stimulus to the sin of adultery in his heart. And that is, in this case, looking on a woman. Now, by the way, this isn't just a, ma a man problem. This is a female problem too. Just like when he speaks about your right hand, he's not saying the left hand doesn't have any problems. He's just giving the illustration here of a man, but this is a problem to male and female alike. This is about looking upon nakedness, looking upon a woman or a woman looking upon a man. And it's an external stimulus, but there's an internal stimulus too because it says he commits adultery in his heart. And so that is the, it's the contrast of the beatitude to the pure in heart early on in the chapter. There's an internal stimulus too. And again, every one of us have this internal failing. It's not something that's unique to a particular group of people. These problems of harboring anger and harboring lustful thoughts are found in the hearts of the human race. And what we're learning here is 
the, 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 the values that society have are very, very different to the Lord's values. Now, if that was true when the Lord taught this sermon, how much more true it is in 2021, when nakedness is rampant and sex and sexualized imagery has become normalized and people speak of these matters in terms where the, the sacredness of the sexual act within the marriage bond has utterly been defiled. And it's led to all sorts of medical problems. It's led to all sorts of psychological problems. It's led to relationship issues. It's led to broken homes and broken marriages. It's led to a situation here in Scotland where most children are born out of wedlock. It's led to a different environment entirely for people growing up. And there is a moral and spiritual vacuum now. And even unsafe folk are aware that they've released something that they can't put back in the, back in the box. And they've opened up a permissive society. And many young folk are growing up in homes where there's no controls whatsoever on what is available to them and what they can look at. <clears throat> and so there is a huge issue, brothers and sisters, here, as um, we begin to think about how we stay pure in a solid world. <clears throat> and remember this, the problem is both internal and is in external. And there is a reduction in standards round about us. Now, there are certain things, of course, that we can do. David, you might remember, committed this sin when he was on the rooftop and he was idle and we've got to watch idleness. A big issue, a big issue when we're all locked down in our homes. Keep ourselves busy. It's a very, very good lesson for us all. Keep yourself busy in the work of God. Keep your mind occupied in righteous things. But it starts in the heart. It was the Lord Jesus who spoke about Matthew 15, out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts and so on. He, the Paul says in verse 26, glorify God in your body. But these are massive issues. And the Lord Jesus uses terms that are, on the face of it, almost barbaric. As he gives the resolution, he says, If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out. Now, this isn't the mutilation of the body that he's speaking about here. This is not the cutting literally out of my eye. But that metaphorical language he does use shows the drastic measures the Lord Jesus is saying in order for God's people to stay pure. And so, some of the young folk will know that people put up on Instagram pictures of themselves that are flirtatious and suggestive. And we've got to stand away from all of that. And if there's a news feed coming into yours, unfollow. Unfollow. Don't allow it to feed your mind. Don't allow it to come in. Internet, films, games, the sexual innuendo, the chat. I know a man and he tells me that every day he comes home from work, he has a bath because the whole of the time he's at work, he's in the midst of a polluted, filthy sexual conversation all around him. Brothers and sisters, the reality is it's around us and we have to take drastic measures at times. And there's apps that you know can suggest things to you that you don't even search for. And if you click on it, it'll give you another 10 to look at. And there is dangers out there and I know and mention was made of the, uh, of, of, of the title of our talk, uh, Following Christ, an Age of Confusion, the same as the, as the book. And there's young folk in there tell us in that, uh, that they have come off things like um, Facebook and they've come off things like um, other social media platforms because they were so conscious of the, the challenge and the risk associated with it. When we were growing up, and even to this day, you know, we were brought up in a home without a television. And yet how much more complex it is with iPlayer and internet. And, and it's very, very difficult, isn't it? And making decisions at an individual level and making decisions at a family level is actually very tricky. It's become much more complex than it ever was. And yet there are things, you know, that it might be that you could get the, the, a trusted other, the mother of the house, perhaps to keep the, the passcodes for the, the Wi-Fi. It might be that you could go into covenant eyes and have a trusted other to make sure that someone else is looking at your web browsing history. But there are things that have to be done. And if necessary, I know a brother has come off the internet entirely. Now that's quite difficult to do. 
we realise it's a bit like the Hoover these days. It's become something that's part and parcel of what we do. But the truth is, brothers and sisters, there are major dangers out there, and it has an impact on us all. And the challenge around this whole issue of adultery in the heart is something the Saviour puts his finger right on here in the resolution that's before us. And Ephesians says, but fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient. Joseph fled from Potiphar's wife. And Paul says to Timothy, flee fornication. These are major challenges. And as the Saviour brings this subject on, he's going to bring it to marriage. He's not going to unpack it all as we have got in the epistles of the unequal yoke and marriage in the Lord and what proper marriage looks like. He's just dealing with the brokenness of things. And so he mentions the whole issue of the divorce that's before us here. As he's, as he's made it clear, the requirement for a holy life. Now, brothers and sisters, these are huge subjects. How difficult it is to speak on it. How difficult it is to give advice to people who are going through it. I would say to young folk here, and if there is a difficulty in your life around this, find someone in the assembly that you can trust to speak it through and to pray with you about it and to talk you through it. But when it comes to matters of divorce and remarriage and marital matters, brothers and sisters, we need to speak about these things, but we need to have a heart. Is there any of us here that doesn't have family where the marriages have not broken up, where there's not been problems and difficulties? And this is, this is very close to home, isn't it? And yet just as the world has changed its values on the matter of purity, so it's changed its values in the matter of marriage. Way back in the 1950s, it happened here in Britain where they, they changed the, the, the whole license around marriage to include divorce for the first time. Didn't happen before. And what happened just a few years ago? Why they changed the whole definition of marriage to include people of the same sex? Now, brothers and sisters, whatever the world does, to destroy the issue of marriage, let's never forget that God's word never alters. And we need to help people who've been broken by this society, who've been brought up in broken homes, who've been saved by sovereign grace perhaps, who are in difficult tension relationships and perhaps never known a proper loving relationship. We need to show them the love of Christ in the assembly. Go out our way to help and support and where there is tension in a marriage, to support the couples, to help them, to guide them. I believe it's a critical feature of a godly elder to be part of that type of discussion where appropriate. To support them, because the world's values out there are altogether different to biblical values. But he is making it very clear that whatever changes take place in society, the Lord Jesus said there are standards. And these standards can't alter. There is no place really for divorce. That's what he's saying. And that's really hard, isn't it? And some of us have had to have conversations with, with people in that very situation. And we need lots of compassion and sympathy and support in it. I break bread with a number of people who've chosen to live single lives for God. And brothers and sisters, this is real. This is not made up. In order to be faithful to the Lord, and what does he say here? He says that if you marry someone who is divorced, you're committing adultery. <clears throat> That's what it says. In Mark 10, it says these words, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another commits adultery against her. And if a woman shall put away her husband to be married to another, she commits adultery. What does it say in Luke 16? Whosoever puts away his wife and marries another commits adultery. And whosoever marries her that's put away from her husband commits adultery. What does it say in 1 Corinthians 7 and verses 10 and 11? Unto the married I command, yet not I but the Lord. Let not the wife depart from her husband, but and if she depart, let her remain unmarried, or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. What does it say in Romans 7 verse 2? The woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives, but if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband lives, she is married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband is dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. 
It's not as if the scriptures are silent on this subject. Brothers and sisters, this is something I know. Down these phone lines, there's pain and pain and pain and pain. But let's remember this, that God's word hasn't altered. When this world has changed, his word's never changed. Do you see, but there's an exception clause here. It says, except for fornication. And this is the only time you'll find it here in Matthew's Gospel. You don't find it in Mark. You don't find it in Luke. You don't find it in Romans 8. You don't find it in 1 Corinthians 7. You say, what does it mean? Well, when you put the word porneo, fornication, right beside adultery, every time in Scripture, one, whilst porneo has a, an all-embracive idea of all sorts of sexual sins, when it's put side by side with adultery, it, it's not tautology. Adultery is sexual sins within the marriage bond. Fornication is before marriage <clears throat> or outside of that and it's in the context of Matthew that you find it here and you say where would divorce be mentioned in Matthew first it's in Matthew chapter one the key to understanding this verse lies just at the door of the gospel when Joseph is making a great prayer in Matthew one about what he should do about Mary he doesn't really fully understand everything uh, and he knows that she is expecting a child and he knows it's not from him and it says he was minded to put her away privily he was minded to divorce her on the on the on the on the, on the grounds of Deuteronomy 24 verse 1 and the angel said fear not Joseph you see that he was in a betrothal period he was in a period a bit like a bit like engagement in our but it was legally binding because the angel says to Joseph, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. She was regarded his wife, although they had never consummated the marriage. They had never brought it together. And he says, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And you'll call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And so the explanation to what fornication is, is found at the very first chapter of Matthew. It's speaking about Mary and Joseph in a betrothal period. And how that within Jewish law, there was um, allowance made for the divorce of a marriage before they'd ever been consummated, before they'd ever come together. Now, brothers and sisters, I think sensitivity around all of these moral matters requires careful judgment by God's people. We can say things and hurt people. But I don't know who's down these lines, and I don't know all the context of everyone here, but I know this, that if we maintain a standard of behaviour that grants peace amongst God's people, and if we maintain in our marriages relationships that are marked by morality and truth and trust, and if we have stable homes, places where young people can thrive and grow up amongst us, and know what it is to be spoken to and listened to, where there's laughter and joy and peace, it will not only be a blessing to the family and to the assembly, but it will be a blessing to society itself and a blessing to the little glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus is addressing this whole area of relationships. May God give us help to maintain the standards that he's set until he comes. It can't be long until he comes. And believe me, the devil's not finished with the whole issue of marriage nor of gender. He's going to attack this until he's confused the masses. We need to explain it to our young people that society's values have changed. It used to be, you know, as long as you give them a little bit of guidance that the, uh, the school would follow up, but not anymore, you know. There's much that's passing in the education system that's not of God at all. And we need to make sure we teach them it in the assembly and we teach them it in the home and we look out for the needy and the vulnerable. We look out for one another. Because every one of us is susceptible to this. Brothers and sisters, pray for the marriages of God's people. Pray for the young people as they grow up in the society. Pray for us all that we might be able to maintain peace, harmony, love, joy, and purity in our lives. Now tomorrow I'm going to deal with the whole issue of authenticity. Who I really am and how can I stand out and be different? Well, the Lord deals with all of these wonderful subjects, this great subject matter is found in the balance of this chapter and we're going to deal with that tomorrow night in the will of God at eight o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. May God richly bless every one of you.